Hello, my name is Amu, and I will be talking about eutrophic induced hypoxia. This is um, a topic that kind of looks into the environmental side of biology, so it's a bit more ecological. And I decided to look into it because lakes and oceans are very biologically active. You know, they are plants and fish and, and crabs and crustaceans and everything. But even amidst all that, there, there may be stretches of water that have a, a very low activity or reduced activity or actually maybe even no activity, you know? Um, you know, like, you know, the, the dead zones. And so I decided, uh, let me look into this topic. Let me see what could possibly lead to that and maybe share it with you guys. And so we will talk about what hypoxia is, what eutrophication is, the interaction of these two. And then we're gonna look at a study done by Simon and Wing on the effects of hypoxia and eutrophication on an organism. And this paper is really fascinating because of the content, but also because it is very recent. It was published in 2022. Um, we will also look at the results and findings of this study, the implications of this phenomenon uh, and possible exacerbations of it as well. And then uh, I will leave you with some takeaway points. So what is hypoxia? Hypoxia is a low oxygen condition. Um, to give, you know, to put like a number on it, it is approximately a 30% saturation of oxygen, which is rather low. Uh, when hypoxia is really, really bad, you know, if, if the oxygen level is reduced to nothing, that is anoxia. So oxygen is depleted, with no oxygen, that is the phenomenon of anoxia. Uh, and hypoxia can occur in both freshwater and saltwater bodies. It is not isolated to one or the other, um, which makes it relevant to all of us because, you know, Salt water is, you know, you may go to salt water for vacation or something. Um, or, you know, we do get some food from salt water bodies, but fresh water bodies are, are also very important because we get drinking water from that. We get fish and other food from that as well. And so this is a topic that is relevant to everyone, I believe. Uh, however, in this presentation, we will primarily focus on. So water bodies, and for that reason, I thought this statistic was very important to put this uh, condition into context. So coastal hypoxia is growing exponentially at a rate of 5.5% per year, which is worrying because, you know, we have a limited amount of water, of salt water in, on, on Earth. And once hypoxia you know, affects all of it, what we what will we be left with? Um, so, you know, that just puts it into context, I believe. Um, so what is eutrophication? Eutrophication is a process of, um, you know, increasing the nutrient load of water. And this is done by anthropogenic action, which is a fancy way of saying human action. It can come about by, you know, the runoff of fertilizer or um, wastewater being deposited into water bodies. Um, and I have this lovely uh, depiction of hot uh, because I felt like this would convey what um, a limiting nutrient is. Because eutrophication, what eutrophication does is that it brings about an increase in nutrients that are limiting because Plants primarily uh, and algae, uh, they need nutrients to grow. Some are found in more abundance than others, uh, but nitrogen and phosphorus are not found in abundance. They are limiting, which is why fertilizers typically supplement that. You know, typically it's like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So in this hot dog example, Nitrogen and phosphorus are our bonds. 
And, you know, we have four buns, but we have five hot dogs. But we can only have four hot dogs and buns. We are limited by the number of buns we have. And in the same way, nitrogen and phosphorus limit um, photosynthesizing organisms. So this is a lovely infographic that, you know, shows us the link between eutrophication and hypoxia. So as a result of eutrophication, plants and algae and phytoplankton are able to grow and they're able to reproduce more. And so they grow, they photosynthesize, they produce oxygen, they respire more and so on and so forth. But in uh, places where um, the temperatures of the water are different you know, as a result of solar heating, the density of the surface water is different from the density of the bottom water. And as such, the mixing of these waters is difficult or does not happen. And so while there is oxygen at the top, there isn't as much oxygen at the bottom. And the organisms at the bottom are still respiring. They haven't stopped. And for the organisms that can respire without oxygen, so for the organisms that can anaerobically expel respire, they are pretty much okay. They can still go about their um, business really. But for the organisms that are unable to respire without oxygen, they end up dying. Which, is, which I mean leads to a decrease in biological diversity. And that's how eutrophication and hypoxia are linked. Um, so Salmon and Wing looked at the Austurvinus Dutch body, which is an edible saltwater clam found in New Zealand. Um, from here on out, I will refer to Austurvinus as, as to Austurvinus Dutch body as Austurvinus. And here you can see a little picture of, of said clam. And so the aim of our two researchers was to determine if there was a combined effect of two stresses. And the stresses that they were referring to are uh, ammonia exposure and hypoxia. So hypoxia, as I mentioned earlier, low concentration of oxygen. Chronic NH3 or ammonia exposure on the other hand, is like an increase in the concentration of um, ammonia. And ammonia is a form of nitrogen. Uh, so, you know, uh, increase in nitrogen, which is eutrophication. So it was looking at the effect of eutrophication and hypoxia on this organism. And the hypothesis was that these stresses would interact in a synergistic way. And we will talk about what synergistic means in the next slide. They also predicted that the response would be greater when both there was both an increase in uh, concentration of ammonia and a decrease in uh, oxygen concentration at the same time. And so synergistic basically means that when two things come together, they result in something much greater than would have uh, been produced if they were by themselves. So I have two examples of this actually. So my first example is a bee. A bee by itself does not do much. It, it is, it's just a bee. But when multiple bees come together and form a hive, they cooperate in a fantastic, mind-blowing way. You know, they each have their own role and they bring about something great, uh, greater than it would have occurred with one B. Or for example, you know, one plus one equals two, that's a normal way of thinking about it. But a synergistic effect, uh, in a, with, uh, with a synergistic effect, one plus one is not two, but could be 11. It's something greater than two. And so basically what this hypothesis was stating was that when both, um, when there's a chronic ammonia exposure and hypoxia at the same time, they will result in even greater stress to the organism 
as compared to the stress that would have um, occurred with an increase in ammonia exposure by itself or hypoxia by itself. And so um, this experiment used adults um, out of Venus and they were used after an acclimation period of 21 days. And during this acclimation period, they were kept in a tank of filtered seawater that was fully aerated. Um, the water temperature of this water was increased gradually. Um, and the only food source that was available to these uh, arterinus was the phytoplankton that, were, that would be present in the water from which they were found. Uh, oh yeah, and um, they were collected from Waititi, Waitati Inlet, Otago, New Zealand. And so the experimental setup was as follows. <laughs> um, we had, they had four tanks uh, with different combinations of ammonia and oxygen concentration. So um, they had, so the different, um, oxygen conditions were hypoxic and normoxic. So hypoxic means that, you know, there was a low concentration of oxygen, uh, about 20% saturation, while normoxic is a normal concentration of oxygen, so 100%. And then the two different concentrations of ammonia are ambient and dose. So ambient uh, refers to the ammonia concentrations that would have been found in Otago Harbor, while dose refers to uh, the chronic ammonia exposure, so like a really high uh, concentration. That's about 40 micrograms per liter. And so we had one tank with an ambient ammonia concentration and an amoxic oxygen concentration, another tank with a dosed ammonia concentration and a normoxic oxygen concentration, um, another tank with an ambient ammonia concentration and a hypoxic oxygen concentration, as well as another tank with a dosed ammonia concentration and a hypoxic oxygen concentration. And so in each five liter tank, there were five, uh, there were 15 clams and they, three replicates were carried out over 45 and each experiment was 45 days. Um, and the temperature was maintained at 22 degrees Celsius throughout. So one thing that they measured was the stress of these organisms. And this was indicated by uh, the siphons. So siphons are these little things that extend out of um, the clam. Uh, they come out typically, or they are seen when the organism is stressed as the clam kind of uh, has a gap. It, it opens its uh, shell. Um, and so they measured the proportion of time with the siphons extended. They also took note of the individuals that died and as they did that, they took the dead individuals away. Um, they also measured the peak ammonia concentration daily. And so we have this figure right here and this figure uh, depicts a siphon activity in each treatment. So here we have the ambient normoxic, we have the dosed normoxic, we have the ambient hypoxic and the dosed hypoxic. And the main takeaway from this is that siphon activity was higher in hypoxic treatments as compared to the normoxic treatments. And this was a, was a statistically uh, significant difference. And this means that the outer venous were more stressed in uh, environments conditions with low oxygen as, a, as opposed to conditions with normal concentrations of oxygen. Um, and then here we have um, the survival of the organisms um, depicted and it is plotted uh, across the 45 days of the experiment. And as you can see, um, the, the main takeaway from this is that the survival of the Oscar Venus was lowest in the dosed hypoxic environment. So uh, right here with the black triangles is the ambient hypoxic 
um, environment is um, my bad. This is an ambient nomoxic um, condition. And here the survival was pretty good. Uh, the survival, they survived all 45 days of the treatment. And then the treatment, de uh, the survival decreased uh, with the dosed nomoxic. It decreased even further with ambient hypoxic. And the maximum uh, mortality was in the um, dosed hypoxic. In this figure, we have depicted the cumulative mortality in the different conditions. And the main takeaway from this is that the cumulative mortality was greatest in the hypoxic dose treatment. And this was a significant um, value. So the last two figures that I um, had in the slides, uh, both of them show the same thing. They show that there was a synergistic effect of hypoxia and ammonia dosing on survivorship. This means that when there was a low concentration of oxygen, as well as a high concentration of ammonia, the survivorship went down much lower than it was in a low concentration of oxygen, a hypoxic uh, condition, um, and a dosed um, uh, condition as well, because the amount of individuals that died was much lower in these two, as opposed to when they were uh, occurring sim simultaneously. And so, yeah, the results demonstrate a clear interaction between hypoxic conditions and ammonia concentration on the organism survival. Uh, also, the peak ammonia concentrations taken across the first 32 days revealed that ammonia concentration increases with treatment intensity. And I have, you know, a little depiction of this. So the stress outstravenous produces more ammonia as it gets more stress, because um, as the ammonia concentration increases, the ausgravenous gets more stress. And as it gets more stress, it excretes more ammonia waste. And as that occurs, the, as, you know, as, ex, uh, as an excrement enters the water, the ammonia concentration increases. And this is a, pos is a positive feedback loop. And so responses to hypoxia and ammonia seen in this study may be conservative estimates, which is, which is very worrying. Because in this experiment, hypoxia and ammonia concentrations were isolated. No other stresses were uh, present in it. And so, you know, these effects are much lower than they would be when all the stresses affect this organism. And other uh, stresses can include like bacteria, contaminants, disease. Uh, and in addition to that, this study um, observed adult astrogenes. It did not uh, look at the possible vulnerabilities of um, non-adult astrogenes. So, you know, young adults, juveniles, or organisms in their larval stages. And another thing that is very worrying is that eutrophication is likely to keep increasing. And this is as a, as a result of anthropogenic actions. Population is growing rather exponentially. And this means that there's an increased demand for food. And as there's an increased demand for food, there will be an increased use of fertilizers, which is not good. Uh, there will be an increased need of various goods and services, which means there'll be an increase in industry and factories. Um, there will be an increase in urbanization. Uh, and, you know, the increase in population will also lead to an increase in wastewater because increased population means increased um, consumption of food and an increased amount of wastewater. Uh, climate change can also exacerbate the, the effect of hypoxia and eutrophication. Um, climate change is, I mean, if you take it as at its simplest, means the warming of environments. 
Um, and, you know, uh, if you recall the one slide that I had that showed, you know, the separation of the top uh, layer of water and the bottom layer of water, you know, if there's a warmer, if the environments are warmer, that means that the temperatures at the top, at the surface of the water will keep increasing, but the temperatures at the bottom will not. And this separation will keep happening and may eventually become permanent, possibly. And this means that the occurrence and persistence of hypoxia will be even more widespread and possibly have more impacts. And my takeaway points, because we're at the end, hypoxia can occur in fresh water and salt water. It, it can uh, lead to stress and reduce survivorship of organisms. In addition to that, the occurrence and persistence of hypoxia will be even more widespread and have more impact. It can also affect everything really. Uh, and climate change can exacerbate these effects. Uh, these are my references. Um, there is a paper by Simon and Link. Uh, and here are all the lovely images that I have used. And yeah, thank you very much for listening to my talk. And thank you, have a fantastic whatever time of day it is. <laughs>